All right, here we go. Okay, so welcome to everyone online. We've got uh, at least 10 participants online. So this is the um, Museum Planetarium breakout session. And hang on, I'm gonna grab a chair. So if you just, just a second. Here during the computer. Okay. Um, Museum Planetarium breakout session. So welcome to our group here. Welcome to those online. There are three other breakouts happening at this time. They are also all being recorded as well. So if you wanted to bop back and forth between them, that's great. If you wanted to stick here and um, and check out one of the other recordings later, that's fantastic. Um, the recordings will be posted by w, w, AAS in about a week-ish. So um, if you miss one, you can definitely uh, uh, see that later. So um, if you want to do a uh, quick intro here, just very quick around the room. So, Dan? And can you guys uh, in the chat hear, could you hear Dan say that? Not really? Not really. Okay. So we'll have to, maybe we will forego <laughs> the introductions and, and I'll just stick here with the microphone. All right. So anyway, we've got folks from uh you know what i'm learning how you all are saying rochester it's not rochester it's rochester <laughs> yeah that i can't do very well um got folks here from the museum as well right yeah, i'm don chamberlain and uh, i'm one of the two people here from uh, uh the strasenberg planetarium where we do uh, uh saturday night uh, observing that type of thing uh, but uh, anyway, that's what we do here. Awesome. And I'm Jim Saito, and I'm the other half of that duo. I point telescopes and talk too much. So we've got a couple folks here from the planetarium, um, and we've got Danielle Adams. From Lowell Observatory. From Lowell Observatory. So, um, and I'm at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, and so we've got some folks online with us, and I know you've been sharing where you all are from, so please continue to do that. And so I just had very, very brief slides to share with you. Um, this is meant to be a discussion. So you'll be able to unmute yourselves and talk if you want to, or I'll leave the chat open and you can do, you can just type your questions and comments in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but the uh, AAS over the last um, six months or so, eight months has um, had the Eclipse Task Force running uh, with some subgroups. And uh, one of the subgroups is museums and planetariums. And what we've been tasked with is uh, coming up with lists of resources to make available on the AAS Eclipse website so that museums, planetariums who want to go and gather info will be able to have a curated list so that we don't all have to search for the same stuff. Um, so we've got stuff that's almost ready to go up on the site. We just need to submit that information to AAS, but we're still in the search for more info and in search for more ideas. So the, um, hang on, give me a second, my PowerPoint here. So uh, we have been talking about three um, or two main questions. What worked well for museums and planetariums in 2017? What didn't work so well? And what are you planning to do? So um, of the group that has been meeting monthly, semi-monthly, quarterly, approximately, when everybody can actually uh, uh, get together, what worked well for museums and planetariums was uh, creating and utilizing freely available eclipse animations. Um, Goddard Space Flight Center, the, the visualization lab, um, did a great job at putting some of those together. Pat Reif at Rice University. Um, has uh, uh, animations, especially for the planetarium theater um, available, and those are available now. Um, and all of these will go up on the on the uh, Eclipse website, the uh, AAS Eclipse website. Um, museum planetarium community was pretty comfortable getting the teacher community ready in 2017. Um, creating and using Spanish language content definitely was a plus for, for a bunch of folks. And using and utilizing that AAS list of vendors of glasses, Eclipse glasses that passed actual testing. Um, and AAS is going to do that again and has already started. So Rick Feinberg um, 
leads that effort. Um, and utilizing that list and basically going, telling everybody, go here, go here, go here, um, check that list, uh, because there are a lot of counterfeits. There are already counterfeits. Um, Rick is already seeing folks sending him counterfeit testing results um, uh, or, or uh, uh, cert certifications that are copied and pasted. So it's already happening and we're still 18 months out. So get ready, <clears throat> that craziness is gonna happen all over again. Um, what we need to do better as a community um, in 2023 and 2024, we got the teachers ready, we need to get the administrators ready. That, that is a never ending job. Um, and so uh, getting in touch with local administrators and um, trying to help them understand that there were no recorded, documented cases of uh, eye damage in children in 2017. It was some of the adults who stared at the eclipse without solar glasses. Um, that was the problem. Um, providing, we need to do a better job as a community, providing uh, instruction to the public about when you wear your glasses and when you take them off if you're in the path of totality. There were people who missed totality in totality because they didn't know they were supposed to take the glasses off during totality. Um, so we need to do a better job at that. Um, how to explain to see the eclipse if you don't have solar glasses or solar viewers. That will also be a never any job because try as we might, we'll, we will not get 330 million pairs of solar viewers and solar, solar glasses out to literally every person in this country. That won't happen. Um, so how do we uh, make those other ideas available and encourage sharing? One of the things that we're gonna do at the Adler is, uh, at least what I'm gonna impose is a strict two viewer limit per person, <laughs> that's it. If you're picking up a, a, a pair of glasses from us, it'll be two and that's it for the ones that we're gonna be handing out. Um, and then uh, provide. this one is gonna be tough, providing clear expectations for how October 23 is different from April 24. At the Adler, this will not be hard. We, it is a partial. An annular is just a partial with better branding. And, um, and so one partial to the, at, at our location is just gonna be the same, just deeper. And so that'll be easy for us. But helping people in the annularity path um, also realize how that that is just a partial eclipse also. Um, and that it will look different from, from what's gonna happen in the path in 2024. So um, the goal of this is a conversation. What else worked for you, um, online folks and folks here, what else worked well for you in 2017? Uh, what else do you want to do better in 23, 24? And what are you working on now? And um, uh, like I said, this is being recorded. So we, I will go back in the recording. I'll take some notes and we can add, if we need to add resources to what we're planning on putting on the AAS website, we'll go ahead and do that. So um, this is just meant to be a free form conversation. Um, please ask questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, so the folks here can see your video windows or your video window on my laptop here. Um, so if anybody online wants to unmute, um, I think you can do raise hands, I think. Can they do raise hands? Yeah, so um, if you want to uh, do a raise hand or we don't have a huge group. Um, so I'm gonna go to the chat real quick and open that up. Um, so, all right, you were all sharing what you were doing and okay. Uh, Jackie says, uh, agreed, we're only sending out one pair of glasses per household. That's really good. That's even stricter. I think I like your, uh, your technique better. Um, does anyone else want to unmute and uh, share questions, comments, concerns? And Rick from the SCOBY Education Center, go for it. Sure, we, um, we have a staff of 10. And so we are very dependent on volunteers. Uh, Mark is also from our area and um, whether we publicize something or not, because we're the only planetarium in San Antonio, uh, we have people who pour out there. And so when we have 
uh, solar viewing glasses or something to give away, there's almost this expectation that if you show up, you should get some. And so that clarity is really important for us. Um, we plan for like 1,200 and have 5,000. Um, and so there's no way that we can make the, meet those needs. Um, even during lunar eclipses, people show up. They can see the lunar eclipse anywhere without any special assistance, but they still show up to the planetarium because there's that expectation. And I like that sense of community that have, apparently has been perpetuated over the last 60 years. Um, but I think that that messaging is really, really important because it's going to be such a wide swath through rural and urban areas for us because we get both eclipses and they both cross exactly where we are. So um, really significant for the messaging side of it. Yeah, one thing um, I forgot to mention was for this last eclipse, we got we, we ordered 250,000 pairs of solar viewing glasses. We're going to get the solar viewer cards this time because you can't wear them on your face. And it encourages, it encourages handing them off from one person to another. Um, so um, so uh, Mickey asks, Michelle, did I hear you recommending viewer cards over glasses yesterday? Is that a trend? Not necessarily, it's just a preference. Um, just because, I mean, some people will be fine with glasses. It's, we found that the glasses were a little harder to store in large quantities. So the cards are only three inches by five inches. And so we're ordering twice as many and they'll probably take up half the amount of space that we, that we had last time. So not necessarily a trend, just a preference, um, trying to gently encourage our audiences to share without hitting them over the head when sharing. So, yeah. Um, so it was, they packed them in boxes of about 4,000 per box. And that was a, that was a regular shipping box about kind of like your, your, your medium to large size Amazon box. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They didn't all come at the, at the exact same time, okay, which is good. Um, and so I'm guessing that it, the, the amount of space that the next round, next batch will take up will be less than that actual amount yeah. because they'll be, they'll be, they're, they're this big instead of being this oh, long. Yeah. yeah. And they're packed in, in uh, they're rubber banded in packs of, I think, 100. So, um, okay. Uh, David, um, you raised your hand. Please go ahead. And are you muted, David? Wait a minute. David, we can't hear you. Fell out. Can you hear me? There we go. Now I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. It, it came unplugged. Um, I hope I'm in the right group because I help run a public observatory from a club perspective. The club runs the observatory. So in Lima, Ohio, and we will be in totality. For 2017, we had a partial eclipse here and we had like 300 people and we did not have any glasses left for eclipse day we were scrambling looking for some and didn't find any so uh, we'd sold out by then we've already got glasses for the next two years we've already got like 5,000 of them and we're expecting to have to order again but we've got our first order already so um let's see what else oh it uh during 2017 we had a thunderstorm come up right after the middle of the eclipse so it poured right after that we had to close the dome quickly and uh you know everybody left and everything but uh, it poured right after the middle of the eclipse but we got at least halfway through before we did have to close so that was kind of an experience but uh for every Eclipse we have, we get, uh, especially a solar eclipse, we get a good crowd here. Uh, we, we're in Lima, Ohio, a small city, and um, yeah, we have a, a decent crowd for any solar eclipse. And even the lunar eclipses, we get a few people out for. So, um, yeah, the main thing is that nobody had enough glasses for the last eclipse, and that's 
that's something that's been said at, at every one of these workshops, I think. Yep. Yeah. But, but we're we're getting ready to uh, speak to groups around the area to the uh, uh, fraternal organizations and things like that, and try to make people aware and you know get the safety message out and all that kind of stuff. So we're getting ready to do that. So, and I don't know if uh, the people have been aware, but we're the observatory that had a telescope stolen last month. Our C-14 telescope was stolen. Somebody broke into the dome and took our telescope. Yeah. I don't know, but. That's awful. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, how did they carry it away? Well, our our dome is on the second level, so they had to climb up over the the the, the second level to get to it. So, wow, someone wanted that telescope more than you did. I guess, and they took our eyepieces, which we just uh, replaced uh, this last year. We got a bunch of new eyepieces, and some more donated to us recently from somebody that had died, and they took a whole box of eyepieces. So if anybody wow. sees a C14 for sale, let us know on the on the uh, black market or something. I don't think they're going to get as much for it as they think they might. So no. there's a lot of C14s out there. And, <laughs> so and, and the, from the Rochester club folks here, have you insured your equipment out at your site? Well, we pay a lot of money for our insurance. Did you, did you hear that? Things no. Like a oh. solar I'll pass it on. probably worth $30,000 in one of our observatories. So well, our our building is city owned, and so they're uh, self insured somewhat, so they don't cover the telescope. Oh, that's too bad. All right, we'll see if the uh, community can come up with some uh, some help for you. Um, so, one thing that we did was we held out thirty thousand pairs of glasses for the day of. Um, so even though people kept contacting us ahead of time to go, do you have it? Do you have it? Nope, we're out, we're out. We will have them day of. And we gave out 30,000 that morning. Um, so that was, um, that was important to be able to not give away everything because you're going to need someone on the day of. So, all right. And Mark Jarena, I hope I spoke, I hope I said that correctly. If you would like to unmute and go ahead. That's as close as you're going to get. Jarena is as close as you will get. Got it. Uh, it's a chat room with too many vowels. Anyway, I'm with the uh, Astronomical Association here in, in San Antonio. So I know about Rick and I have met. So it, it is kind of weird. The one thing I'll ask is um, Night Sky Network, which is a NASA thing. I wonder if they're going to give out uh, glasses or viewers at all. Because they typically have done that. And of course, it's always, you have to hold some off, I guess. Right. I uh, don't know if anyone is part of the Astronomical League. If you know, if you happen, if anybody, Astronomical League members have heard if the Astronomical League is going to give out glasses. If they do, if the Night Sky Network does, I suspect it would be through the Astronomical League, which all the clubs pretty much belong to anyway. So. Yeah, and ours was a hard time getting in there. We're one of those ones that's like 10% who's in the league, so not too many people are okay. there. I thought it was NSN, so that's one of the things. We just have to remember to hold off some for, for our own members, you know, give out two per, because part of the thing is everybody, well, can you give them out to the general public? Well, then you don't have any for the other people to show. Right. And I think I still have my 2017 ones. I think a lot of us do. So I'm good for that. <laughs> Um, and Spencer, you had another comment? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, all of us in this room <clears throat> will need to learn how to herd cats because the crowds just go berserk. And if you do not have control on your crowd, you're going to have a lot of problems. You need stuff like uh, the tape that the police use to block off places. You need a whole bunch of stuff like that. And you always forget things that, you know, you, you might think about 
if you're going to handle a large crowd. When I was in Irmo for 2017, Irmo, South Carolina, we had a big parking lot, big grassy area. I had it all blocked off with uh, crime scene tape. And the kids, they, <laughs> they were just running wild. And it was a hard, a hard thing to keep control of a, a it was only a crowd of about 400 people, but it was hard to keep a control on, on the crowd. As a matter of fact, I had my telescope set up for automation with a computer controlling three cameras. And what I didn't know was during the partial phases, some little kid came running by and got past the uh, crime scene tape and just barely touched one of the legs on my tripod. So my camera frame was like this and the sun was down here. Oh dear. So. The best laid, the best laid plans are great <clears throat> until you actually encounter the audience. <laughs> and then you find out where it all failed. Um, Out of curiosity, have people dedicated areas to their staff's family mm -hmm. so that, you know, for example, we have a lot of staff here. A number of us have significant others and kids or uh, loved ones that they want to bring in. And it's Monday afternoon. We can't necessarily get to our kids, especially if we get school canceled. And I've been toying around with the idea of a green room, if only for staff families, kids, parents, whomever. So I'm wondering if anyone has done something like that because one of the things I keep hearing again and again and again is you wanna be with very specific people to experience the eclipse. You wanna be with the ones you care about. So can is there anything we can do to improve the staff's ability for that? That's a great question. Does anyone online want to Anybody have a special set aside area for your members, your, your uh, families, the folks you particularly deal with? I'll watch out for raised hands. I mean, this has nothing to do with like, you know, say the eclipse, but where I'm currently working uh, over in Fishers, Indiana, uh, we have uh, large events. Like right now we are in the midst of Headless Horsemen, which is four days a week all through October where we have about 4,000 people sending our grounds every night um, for that event. Uh, and then also a Merry Prairie holiday that takes place in December, pretty much about the same timeline and about the same number of people that, that attend. Um, so in, in that case, because we are an outdoor museum, we um, primarily an outdoor museum, living history museum, we do have like shelters, uh, different shelter areas, um, that can be utilized. Uh, sometimes we use that uh, for different sponsors, um, you know, that, you know, have different companies that are coming in. So they have their own designated space for those, those big events. Uh, so that is a possibility. I love the idea of having a space for the staff uh, since we're already gonna be there <laughs> anyway. Uh, one working, the, some of us working the event and then others that are gonna get to, to enjoy the event too. So, uh, but I, I can foresee that that's one way that we could utilize that space. Lucia, you wanted to, to mention something as well? Go ahead and unmute. Yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention something. Um, I was at the um, 2017 eclipse. I was in Missouri at this um, big field. What I did notice was they had a special play area set aside for people with telescopes and so on, and they were taking pictures and didn't want to have kids running around and, you know, knocking on their stuff. So it was kind of a special area set aside. Everybody else was in this big field and was sitting down and I was actually in the big field. I had a, a telescope, but I wasn't taking pictures and I was perfectly content with people coming up and wanting to look through it. So, um, but yeah, but most of the telescopes were in this set aside area. And I think that may have helped some of the, um, control some of the crowds around sensitive equipment. Yep. Mitzi, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, this this isn't eclipse related, but it's related. 
the Von Braun Astronomical Society is celebrating Astronomy Day today. And what we have done in the past is have porta potties for, for our public to use. Our restroom is reserved for members only. And we also have a library and, and that is also used as a kind of a relaxation spot for folks to go in and, and just take a breath uh, because of the hordes of people that, that's come through. Um, I'm hoping we'll have hordes today. This will be our first astronomy day in three years. Yeah, it sounds like you will have much happier staff yes. if their families are taken care of. So if it's possible to, to get a, a, a child carer to come in, or not designate one of the staff to do it, but have a child carer to come in and help out, do some games and, and play around with folks and just have them so that they know they have a safe place to go and not they're not out on the road and uh, trying to get through all the traffic, especially after the eclipse. So having a little party, um, whether or not uh, certain beverages are allowed uh, at the party, that's up to you. Um, but having a special little celebration afterwards, I think it would be really fun. Um, uh, on that same one, it's Mitzi with uh, areas. How have people designated paid versus free areas? Uh, Mitzi, did you hear that? No, I did not. Um, how, how have people designated free areas versus paid areas at events? Um, or have you, or did you not? <laughs> uh, for, for Astronomy Day, everything is totally free. We do many planetarium programs and it's just intended to kind of whet the appetite and hopefully people will come back. Um, so we have not, we have not done any, any free versus charged areas, but we do charge for planetarium programs on Saturday night. Um, and then observing afterwards is free. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> you to add? Spencer, do you want uh, to add? Yep, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, like I uh, was saying a, a few minutes ago, I used crime scene tape, blocked off an area for uh, shadow bands blocked off an area for TV and media blocked off an area for uh, adults that were just going to sit there uh, blocked off an area for telescopes and stuff. Um, crime scene crime scene tape is very handy. So that's 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 a good thing to have. I'm, I'm intrigued by uh, setting up the areas just for people to sit down um, because granted you're outside, but still <laughs> that's uh, providing seating is gonna be really important. We've done um, like members areas previously um, versus general public, but we got rid of our membership program. So we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, often was more trouble than it was worth because then you really start segregating your audience and people start feeling less than if they see something cool going on in a spot where they don't have access to it. So trying to make as much of it as open as possible. Um, and then the green room for the family or families or, or what have you is a good thing to do, but anyway. Um, Let's see, I'm just checking the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Rick mentioned um, uh, logistic, mentioning logistics for safety tents, medical support, lost children, all that stuff. Uh, information, where should I go? Because um, people are gonna know how to get to you. They're just not gonna know what to do when they get there. <laughs> so, um, so, all right, any more questions, comments, ideas, problems that we can hopefully solve or commiserate with? Um, and Steve, go right ahead. 
Yeah. You know, got it. Whoops. Steve, we don't hear you. Uh oh, did we lose Steve? Let's try again. Well, until we get Steve back, Mark, go ahead. I have the one comment and that's kind of, has been told to us. And of course we help out Rick Marner there at, at SCOBY. It's also occasionally good. You might pick up your volunteers and maybe one of your volunteers, not everybody's gonna have a solar scope for this event, for example. So those might be your, your rovers who can rove around and explain things and do a better job of good natured crowd control. Because if you have somebody who can answer those questions, it's a whole lot better than, oh, you can't go here and you can't go there. Um, having uh, people roam around just with glasses to share, to, to give them back. But having people just wandering around, standing in line, they're, they just let them see it that way might be a good idea. So Alicia, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm from uh, Wonder Lab Museum in Bloomington, Indiana. We're in the path of totality and we experienced the 2017 partial with a surprise at <laughs> how many people came to the museum. My question, I think, I'm just hoping someone can give me an idea. How do you even begin to estimate how many pairs of glasses to have on hand? Um, and keeping in mind, we're a small facility, like very, very small in comparison to lots of other museums. Um, I mean, we have a gift store. Put it this way, last, during 2017, we had a, like 200 pairs of glasses that we got free from NASA. And we thought, oh, we'll just, we'll do, an, we'll do a program on making solar viewers, which we did. And one of the giveaways, if you attended the program, you could also get a pair of glasses. The day of the event, we had 500 people lined up down the street before we opened. That doesn't happen at our museum. That's more people than we can fit in our place, right? Um, and so we're trying to estimate this year and I have just no idea what kind of types of quantities to, to get. Yeah. I think Rick has the right idea in the chat. Embrace that you will never have enough. <laughs> but I mean, that, that prompted an idea. Maybe glasses day of isn't the way to go. Give away all your glasses ahead of time. Provide at your institution projection ways for people to see the eclipse that way. So if they don't have the glasses, find other ways to see the eclipse. Um, via the the shadows through your hands or the or the, the light through your hands or um, uh, colanders or make lots you can you can provide the the cereal box pinhole projectors and there's lots of ways to see it without without the glasses and I think that might be the way to go day of um, because if you say you're going to give them out day of you're going to get way more people than you have glasses so give them right. all out ahead of time. Yeah, and then they uh, project <laughs> images of the eclipse through telescopes or, or what have you, solar filters, so people can take pictures and 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 um, uh, that might be an idea for you. Yeah, no, that's a great idea, and I don't think we'll give them out for free again. That was something we were like, oh, that'll be fun. Um, but I does anyone have any way to estimate numbers for an order, like at all? Like, uh, I keep hearing sell as many as we buy, but really, <laughs> will we? I don't. Maybe we will. And we're not the only place in town that whatever your budget can handle and it'll yeah. just never be enough <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> and once they're gone they're gone although someone just put uh can you use eventbrite or some way for people to reserve them although you'll end up getting people who will reserve them and yeah. never pick them up yeah. um so just thought i'd ask <laughs> yeah yeah it's a never-ending problem so one of the things we're looking into is doing party packs or neighborhood packs. So A, as much as we want people here at the museum, we can't have everyone here at the museum. We know our population limit. Uh, and so, yeah, I can leave these things. Oh, you're good, you're good. Okay. So one of the things that we're looking into is making these packs so that, you know, people can take them and run their own events and we don't have to deal with people here. So that is one of our big pushes. There's a question uh, that you probably have all been or colleagues of yours are good ways of getting the teacher community ready. Uh, so I'll touch upon teachers and administrators. So a lot of it is honestly just 
peer out reaching out um, either through the teacher associations, directly through the schools, through the PTAs. Uh, PTAs are another way that you never normally think about. Uh, administrators, we've been reaching out to our local system. We've been talking to the superintendent. And the fun one is if you can track down the different committees that the local superintendents do together, it's to find their calendar committee and find one of them, uh, one of the superintendents there to then convince, to then bring it up to that larger group. Uh, there's also the statewide associations, both for teachers and for admin. Uh, and it's honestly, you can show up at meetings. There's a lot of public meetings uh, that you can just kind of show up at. That's how we've gone about it is just a lot of cold calling, emailing, phone calls. Uh, if you want to go up to the state level, you can contact your Department of Education. That's taken a bit more work, um, but it does work. Well, you can get discouraged. What may yes. happen is you you get with the teachers, they got it. You get with the school administrators, they got it. And then the one thing you can't control is the lawyers for the school districts get a hold of the administrator the day of and go, uh-uh, nope, don't let them go outside. Liability issue. And they could they could cancel all that hard work. So trying to get with the administrators is great because the teachers may have every intention of doing this, but if the administrators don't let them go outside, they won't go outside. So um, yeah, it's it's unfortunately uh, what we have to deal with. Speaking of teachers, I'm wondering uh, when people start talking to their schools, and this is something that's probably going on in the educator thing, is anyone sort of reaching out to the substitute teacher organizations? Because we're already in a shortage. And you know, as many teachers are gonna try and take off to travel for the eclipse, both in and out of the path. So I could see a lot of people, you know, taking off that day. Uh, and then, you know, substitute teachers don't have to say yes. See if that comes up. Um, uh, folks are asking if you're providing activities for the teachers. Ah, we're, uh, we're not, Yes and no. We're not providing all the materials to every teacher, but we're providing the resources. We're pointing people in the right direction. Thanks to 2017, I mean, uh, resources like NISNET, for which they're doing a workshop next week, a free workshop. Um, they have a lot of those hands-on activities. I mean, the Girl Scouts have a hand guide already for the Eclipse from 2017 of activities. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, so that's one of those nice things of, We'll point people in the right direction. Uh, I know personally here at the RMSC, we are going to do some training that we can't officially announce with an ambassador program and getting people out into the community. But teacher-wise, we'll be pointing people in the right direction, try and provide training as much as we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question about timing. Yeah. Can you hear me over there? Uh, I have a question about timing. Uh, the 2017 eclipse was my first an avid amateur astronomer that does a lot of outreach. But I found myself on a field in Kentucky with my Schmidt Cassegrain and a solar filter and people lining up at 9 a.m. Because if you weren't there by 9 or 10 a.m., you didn't get in. So you have a large captive population in some of these events. And you have to design some ability to use that time for solar education. I thought that was some of the most valuable times of the day, be long before first contact. Uh, and people can line up at your telescopes and things and you can teach about astronomy. And it prepared much of the crowd because after the event, you found out there were people who had no idea what they're looking at and kind of dismissed the whole uh, circumstance. But if you can build that anticipation. So when do you start your events? What do you do during those hours before the event? So at least for the Adler, we were off the path. We're going to be off the path for the next one, although a deeper partial. Um, we started our event at nine in the morning, I believe, nine or 10 in the morning. Um, and then uh, it ran till I believe four in the afternoon, uh, just because we knew people would trickle in and they would trickle out. But we had that entire two and a half, three hour time period for the eclipse. There wasn't one 
specific time where people needed to all be in one spot at the same time. They had that entire, that's the benefit, I guess, of having it be a partial. There's, there's no one time you have to get everybody in the same location. Um, so uh, providing, we had partner tents and activities going the whole time. But I believe it started mostly with having the projection telescopes out and, and just uh, adding in more as the, as the crowds got bigger and, and, and time went on. But yeah, there's, there was a lot going on for that. So, um, hey, Rick is saying that he has something to share. Um, Rick, why don't you uh, email me? Um, I'm going to put my, I put my email address in the, uh, in the chat. Why don't you email me uh, the link and we'll just make sure it gets out to everybody um, via the AAS Eclipse website. All right, uh, is it Jackie? Am I saying that correctly? I hope I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, you are actually. <laughs> Thank uh, you. All right, go ahead. Um, so a couple of things I just wanted to mention. Um, so over here in California, um, in San Francisco specifically, we are gonna be partial for both. Um, and for the annular, it's going to be actually early in the morning before our opening hours. So our big push is to, tell people how to view it from where they are. Um, that, and same thing with uh, the to, uh, total eclipse, we're gonna get even smaller uh, coverage. So we're pretty much saying, do it where you are. You're not gonna see much difference here. Um, and so I think that's a really good way of if you're off totality to be able to just kind of really emphasize. And I think that's also what um, NASA is doing is, um, really emphasizing going out where you are and use what you have to do that. Um, and I definitely recommend uh, watching the video from Vivian White for the uh, informal educator activities. She does a great job of doing, um, using household materials of how to view. And that's something that we definitely emphasized last year or last time uh, in 2017. Uh, we were also not in totality, so uh, we have experience with this. Um, and we definitely recommend using like the colanders or um, creating how to create a pinhole. Um, and then for the teachers, we held both virtual and on-site workshops for teachers of how to talk about the phenomena of a solar eclipse. Um, and then also provided them activities to do with their students before and during the eclipse. So for example, we actually created a um, little spreadsheet of um, how they could draw what they're seeing, um, both before, during, and after. Um, also had a way, um, Google had, a, I think it was Google Scientific Tools app for a while um, had a light meter that you could download as an app um, and taught the students how to use that to figure out like how much light they were getting. Now that there's the sonification one, I am very excited to pass that along. Um, so that way there, there's actually a reading that they could have. Um, and here in San Francisco, we are known for our fog. It was foggy that day. They couldn't actually see it, but they could actually detect a difference in how much light they were getting, um, even with the partial eclipse. So that was really cool to be able to be like, everybody was disappointed, was very sad that, oh, we can't actually see it, but they still were able to see that this phenomena actually is happening. Um, so that was a really cool, uh, happenstance. I did not plan for that, but that was really great that it actually happened. Um, so a lot of fun activities, um, not only before to talk about what a solar eclipse is, but also if you can figure out some ideas of what to do during, um, especially because it's so long, teachers are like, what are we going to do for like three hours? Um, so yeah. Uh, there's a question that came in the chat. Uh, are, are you planning on including any information about sunspots? in any of your information going out to the public or activities of the day because there will be of course increased sunspot activity 
of course, in 2017, there was a magnificent group of sunspots uh, on the sun. So even that during uh, somewhat solar minimum-ish. Um, so anybody including sunspot uh, info? Yeah, we will be doing that at Lowell Observatory. We have um, a couple solar astronomers at Lowell. So we'll, you know, and focus activities that lean towards some um, solar astronomy. Cool. Yeah, um, one thing I would add uh, simply to what Jim has already said there, uh, you've got a lot of time period out there when people are standing around and you need to be able to fill in. Luckily in 2017, indeed, there were some nice sunspots which then allowed us to drift off and talk about that kind of thing. So uh, thinking about something like that, but I was just reminded <laughs> with your comment there about fog, does anybody have plan B? Yes. <laughs> now, yes. if you could share some plan B, <laughs> we got a 50% chance of needing plan B here in Rochester, New York. That means you need to plan for plan B to be plan A. <laughs> so yeah, plan for clouds and be amazed if it's actually clear. So go ahead. So there is a couple of plan Bs that I'm, uh, I'm working on plan B, C, and D. Uh, <laughs> one for cloud, uh, you know, one concern is clouds, but my other concern is everything else the weather can toss at us. Mm -hmm. uh, snow, Rochester will deal with, we can deal with snow. Rain, is is along the same lines, but more Rochesters will be out in snow. Wind is the biggest thing I'm concerned about because any displays, any shelters, anything that needs to be outside will need to be bolted down. And we've had some bad windstorms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some sandbags can hold things up, but if you get a good gust, that's going to really hit people. The one thing that you probably can count on is if the weather, the worse the weather forecast is supposed to be, the smaller your crowd is going to be. And you'll be able to then get everybody inside, hopefully. The, the so. other part is, you know, every projector we can get our hands on, getting some sort of live stream going, uh, contacting a number of the local theaters beforehand, and then get people outside for that, you know, three minutes and 38 seconds or that few minutes before and few minutes after, and then get everyone back inside. Yeah. Uh, temporary structures, those that are clear, there are really good clear structures out there. In fact, a number of festivals use them here locally uh, that are even, you can make nice and warm looking into that. But. Yep. Uh, someone said, uh, can't fit 5,000 people into a 100 seat planetarium. True. Um, so one thing you may want to look into if you need a live stream is bump up your, your outdoor Wi-Fi capability because chances are people are coming with their phones. And so if you provide the link where they can watch the, the NASA live stream on their phones, um, just make sure you've got good Wi-Fi capacity and outside. Separate one for the public and one for your staff. Yes, yes. Don't have your staff fighting on the same Wi-Fi stream as everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And hardwire whenever, whenever yep. possible. Uh, hang a screen outside. Yeah, if it's not going to be uh, terribly windy, you could you could stick a sheet on the side of your building. Um, it doesn't even need, need to be fancy. Yeah. Uh, here in That's true. Yeah. Onto, onto the physical planetarium. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Get creative with uh, with walls. <laughs> so one thing that's been talked about a lot in the sessions was people with disability challenges. Yes. Um, uh, there are some tricks you can use uh, in some of the partial phases in hospital rooms. We put a little mirror on the sun facing uh, sill with a little pinhole in it. You could project the partial phases across the room on their uh, uh, wall. We even did it for a couple of paranoid classes that we would refuse to let their students do outside. Yeah. So think about how we start to include those people. It's been a big topic upstairs. That's an interesting point projecting it for classes, how teachers could use a simple mirror. My local school district would not let them outside to my telescope. Yeah, use a, use a, have them make sure they can get, just have a mirror handy and project an image of the, of the sun under the wall. That's a great idea. So you have to determine for the size of the pinhole to get right. enough resolution and, you know, enough light to what the distance. Right, so right. play with it ahead of time. 
of that. But with there being so many sunspots, you can you can uh, you can easily at least check to see what your you resolution have seen is. Sunspots with that technique, yeah. but you got to get a, a small enough spot, mm -hmm. uh, and that tends to make it dimmer. So it depends on how bright the room is. You, know, you got to play with it. So go prepared to change the size of the spot on the sun. Is it a it's a flat mirror that, yeah, that you're using? Yeah, flat mirror. Take your wife's cosmetic mirror and it works just fine. So if we provided a template to go over a mirror, maybe to that might work. Yeah, then I blocked it, block it off a little bit of tape, but it has to be a very sharp edge yep. of the tape. Electrician's tape works well. Cool. All right. Um, okay. Well, the, that has to be flat against the mirror, or you lose all the resolution. That's why you know electrician's tape works well. So there, there's a comment that that where in Austin and a lot of the parks they won't have electricity available for projecting a live view. So um, definitely uh, uh, having places to go throughout the city. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's, having there's, having to deal with these. To do a pop-up <clears throat> system. Um, generators. Generators. There's a lot yeah. of good camping batteries that can last a long time. Now. Oh, true. Yeah. Telescope batteries, the the the, the portable power right. tanks, um, yeah, get all that stuff now because we're gonna all be fighting each other for it uh, in about a year. So, oh, how early did you order porta potties? Mm. Oh sure. Huh. Folks, I'm, I'm folks who ordered them order online, did you all order porta potties? I'm putting in my order. order. Yeah. Well, the disabled uh, porta potties yeah. were an issue. Make sure that they're ADA. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. ADA porta potties for sure. Um, and uh, the problem we had in 2017, because it was August, Lollapalooza happens um, a couple weeks before, or it happened a couple weeks before, because it's always the, the first weekend in August. And so a lot of the summertime festivals already had the porta potties already booked. So that and golf carts. Um, so if you need golf carts, you need to order those now too. Um, but April shouldn't be quite as bad, at least in our area, because there aren't any outdoor festivals. In Boston, April. It, will it will be right. South by Southwest, South by Southwest will have the yeah, exactly. So um, suggestion for screen logistics: place the screens where the solar viewers are blocked by trees, etc., or on buildings across large uh, open spaces. So yeah, it's a great idea. All right, how much time do we, we're almost done. So last minute raise of hands, questions, comments, anything else, we are almost done with our session. And by the way, if I forget, thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone for sharing everything. Um, so yes, anything from this end? Uh, to join the uh, AAS group uh, subcommittee. Yes, um, yes. Uh, if you want to join the um, Eclipse uh, working group, uh, go on the Eclipse website, uh, eclipse.aas.org, and you can, uh, if you want to join the, the subgroups and, and help put some of these lists and things together, or if you want to suggest some stuff to us, please do. Um, and uh, yeah, someone was posting the instructions for the Sunspotter. I'm glad to see that someone is trying to figure out how to do a less expensive version because those are expensive. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. What a big one. Um, all right. Spencer says, thanks to all and let's get ready to rumble. I think that is the great way to end the session. So thank you, everyone. Thank you online. Um, and uh, thanks. Yeah, we'll be back in an hour. We're going to go have lunch. So you guys go grab lunch or coffee or breakfast or wherever you are. Um, we'll see you back in an hour. We'll be at one o'clock Eastern um, back with the session or maybe a couple minutes after getting everybody back together. So uh, join us for this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Do I? Much better. Do I? Just end meeting. Just end meeting? Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>